But I really believe God wants to share a message with you today. Um, and this message has, has kind of been brewing in my heart for the last two, three weeks. And it's, it's strange the way the message came to me. Because I was sitting at a rugby match twice. <laughs> and for those that know me, should know, I don't like rugby. <laughs> I wear the lion shirt because it came with the wedding package. <laughs> <laughs> but if you would ask me in my own capacity, for what response kreeg jy, I would say, what are you call then? <laughs> you know, whoever's got the ball, you're doing a good job. <laughs> okay? <laughs> just, just do it. Try. Don't eat so many ball. But in, in this whole scenario of me sitting and watching rugby with my wife, and my, my aanstaande, well, not my aanstaande, not my school, so that's okay. Okay, but I get it right. <laughs> but in, in, my, in my moment, sitting there and seeing people jump up and down and having fun, and I'm not going to preach that rugby is an idol, okay? I preached that before, so you should know that by now. Um, anything good can become an idol in your life, for that matter. But... Um, as I was sitting there, I was, I was watching the people. And what came to mind was, man, it's, it's really funny to me how every person in my row <clears throat> and in front of me and behind me knew how to play rugby better than the players themselves. <laughs> and they knew the rules better than the referee himself. You know, and, and when things are going our way and the referee, like advantages us, then it's like, yeah, go, go referee. And as soon as he like red cards us or something, it's like, man, Australia promised you a farm somewhere and you're <laughs> against us. And man, this guy is like, he's offside. And I'm like, but he's on the other side of the field. If you had science on school, you would know you have to sit directly in line to see if he's offside. <laughs> yeah. And people are all over the place. And then I think to myself, I'm like, man, you've got everything to say. But I promise you, if I put you on that field, you wouldn't know what to do. Because playing the game is a whole different ball game than spectating the game. And God dropped this penny in my heart. And he said, following me is a whole different ball game than spectating me. And he started playing with this message in my heart. And you know what? Jesus didn't call us to be spectators. But unfortunately, most of us are. You see, a lot of Christians, and I'm afraid of this, and I say this with the utmost love and respect, but a lot of Christians think they're on the way to heaven, but they are actually on the highway to hell because they think they are Christian because they prayed a prayer once upon a time and gave their life to God. But praying the prayer and giving your life to God in a prayer is not salvation. Salvation is taking up your cross and following Jesus. Salvation is surrendering all that I am and I give it into His hands. See, that's why I can confidently say, if you have made that choice to give your life to God and after that, your life looks worse off sin-wise and, and habit-wise and nothing changes in your life, you should question your salvation because then you are merely spectating Jesus and not following Him. And I know these are very hard words to swallow, but signing a dotted line doesn't make you saved. Following the Savior does. You see, and when you look at the words of Jesus in Matthew, we can get it on the screen, Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and spectate me. Take up your cross and watch me from a distance. No. He says, take up your cross and follow me. And you can see it, like every single time as he walks around and he calls disciples. Man, they were busy with work. They were busy with their father's business. They were running the business. And, and Jesus walks by 
And he goes, hey, Simon, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And you know what the crazy thing is? They drop everything and they go. Everything. They just leave it. It's like, man, I'm following Jesus. There's a total surrender. There's a giving of themselves. How many of us have actually dropped things in our lives and followed Jesus? Or how many of us are going like, I'm coming, God. Just give me that answer. I'm coming. Because we want to cling to stuff in our life and we don't want to give over to God. You see, we need to surrender to God. We need to follow Him. I went to the dictionary actually to see what, what the word is to, to follow. And it says to go or come after, move behind in the same direction, to accept as a guide or leader, accept the authority or give allegiance to, to conform to, comply with, or act in accordance with, to obey, to imitate, or to copy. You see, the number one call of the gospel, of the good news of Jesus, the number one call of the kingdom of God, is come follow me. It was Jesus' words to countless of people as he walked this earth, come follow follow me. Come and be yoked with me. Follow me. Not pray a prayer, sign a card, sit down, watch from the bench, you'll be okay. Take up your cross and follow me. To be yoked means to be joined, to be coupled, to be linked together, united. See, Jesus didn't call us to play church. He didn't call us to be bench warmers in a church service. He called us to be partakers, not just spectators. You see, and many of us want to take the spectator role in our lives when it comes to God. We, were, we know how to play the game, right? And that's why from a spectator position, we can tell God, man, you're messing up in my life. You're not doing right. Why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this? Why are you doing that? We think we, you know, judge, jury, and everything together because we know better. But God knows best. Because He created you. See, who, who are we, mere created beings, to tell our God, our Creator, this is how you should do life, God. This is how you should make my life. This is what I want. And if I don't get it, you're a bad God. You're non-existent. You're not real. You're not loving. Have you ever thought of, that's just our perspective? Because we brought up in a, in a world that says instant gratification, instant satisfaction. If I pray a prayer and I snap my fingers, it should work. God is my cosmic Coke machine. If I push the right button, out comes what I prayed for. But it doesn't work like that. See, because as soon as we start following Jesus, you have a big target on your back saying, here I am, devil, come for me. And that's where most people go wrong because preachers don't usually tell you, come to Jesus, you're going to be Satan's worst enemy. Happy living. They don't do that. Because why? That's a, that's a bad sign-up message. Your life is awesome now. Everything is okay. You can go on as you please. You can do what you want. But come to Jesus, then everything has to change and things are going to go quite crappy afterwards because the devil is going to try and get you off track. Yes, we lose things in life. Yes, things doesn't always go our way. Yes, things doesn't always seem to work as they should. Do we have all the answers? No. I think nobody on this planet has all the answers as to why things happen the way they do and why God allows certain things and stops other things. Why God heals certain people and doesn't heal others. But He knows because He is creator. He sees future. He sees past. He sees present. He knows the bigger picture. Therefore, He says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, but you have to trust me in order for me to be good to you and show you that I am good. Just because my circumstances suck doesn't mean my God sucks. 
It just means the devil is having a good time trying to defeat me, but I need to be strong in the Lord and stand against whatever he brings my way. Does he win a few battles? Of course. We're not professionals in the art of war. We're growing. Is God going to protect all of his attacks? No. Why not? Because he uses it to help us. You see, what we don't understand is we think that, that, that God allows things and it's okay, and, or sometimes He allows stuff and it's not so okay, and we try and argument this in our head. But let me tell you something. If God would completely lift His hands from Satan and say, Satan, do as you please, He will utterly destroy every single one of us completely. God limits Satan's power. God limits the devil's power to a certain degree. Because he's got a, he sees what we don't see. Oh, John, but you weet nie, ek weet. Ek nie hoe jy voel nie, maar ek weet hoe ek gevoel het. I know how I felt when my mom died of cancer. I know how I felt when I found out I was adopted and my mother was raped. I know how I felt losing things. I know how I felt when I had to sacrifice almost everything to follow God. But today I can stand and I can say, it is worth it. Because He makes the pain bearable. Because He carries me through when I cannot. Because He gives me peace in the midst of my storms. Because He is my source of joy. He is my source of strength. And when I can't go, He does. But in order for that to take place, I need to be following Him. I need to be surrendered completely to Him. Not just a prayer. Not just a God take my life. Hey God, here is my life. I give it to you. And I live for you. See, there's three things that, that we require in order to trust God for, to this extent, to follow Him. The one thing to follow God is you require great trust. Come on, we can't follow leaders we don't trust, right? But the problem is, with God, we cannot trust Him conditionally. Because most of us want to. God, if you, then I. If you prove to be faithful, then I'll follow you. If you show me, then I'll believe. But God says, no, believe in me, and I will show you. Trust in me. Don't, don't limit yourself to what you see. Don't limit yourself to what you experience, because your experiences might be a reality now. It might be something that is taking place in your life right now. It might be the most horrible, most worst pain that you've ever experienced right now. But right now is nothing compared to eternity. Come on, the Bible says we are just a breath. We're just a vapor. Some get to live 80 years, others 150 years. Some people just get to live 10 years, some one year, and some doesn't even make it. Do we know why? No, we don't. But life is a vapor, and the little bit that we've got, we've got to use it to follow Jesus, not waste our life on needless things that even, it doesn't even touch eternity. We're so caught up with entertainment. We're so caught up with, with what we're busy with. We're so caught up with our works and, and getting enough money to get by and providing for our family. And it's all good and well in its place. But if it's all you do and it's all you live for and there's nothing more, your life will be empty and meaningless because you need to follow somebody. And even if you don't follow Jesus, I promise you, you are following someone. It might be yourself or it might be Satan, but a newsflash, if you're following yourself, you are following Satan in any case. You see, we require great trust. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Why? Because our understanding is limited. Our understanding needs a frame of reference. It needs something to hold on to. Our understanding is just what we see. And what we've experienced. God's understanding is, is greater and beyond that. We can't even fathom when we talk about God's mind. 
It's so vast that he created, he thought up every single thing. Go and do research biologically, how intricately your body is woven together and how every single organ works together. It's amazing how everything just works. He didn't just, big bang, there it is. Someone created it. The way the earth orbits around the sun at, at exactly the same speed it should, at exactly the right moment it should, at exactly the right angle that it should. Why? Because if it was slightly closer to the sun, we'd all be burning to death. And if it was slightly further away from the sun, we'd all be freezing to death. It's at the right position, at the right place. It's turning at the right time, at the right speed. Why? Because there is an infinitely wise and smart creator that created it all and You know what's the best thing? You are the crown of His creation. Vast galaxies that expands by the day. I mean, I don't even know how many, 9,000 million galaxies there are. But we find out about more of them every single month about. And through all of those galaxies, God makes you and He says, "You you are the best of the best of what I can create. And that is why Satan hates you, because you are what he wanted to be. He wanted to be like God. And to just to prove to a point to him, God made you like himself. We need to trust him. And in order to trust him, we need to realize who is calling you to follow. It's not just a mere man that is saying, follow me. It's creator God that says, come follow me. Does he need me to follow him? No. He's a self-sustaining, self-existent God. He can, he's pretty okay without us. But he wants you to follow him. Why? Because he longs for your love and affection more than you can ever imagine. So he invites you and he opens his arms and he says, come follow me. You see, once, once you realize who is calling you, you have either two ways to respond. It's complete surrender and trust, or it's run away and do your own thing. It's the only two responses in the Bible. There's no gray areas. There's no, God, I'm going to test you out. And I'm going to just like walk the line slightly. God doesn't do that. Look at every single person in the Bible. When he called, they dropped everything and they followed. Except one guy. He said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the guy clung to his riches and he said, I can't. Don't be that guy. God is calling each and every one of you to come and to follow him and to trust him, to surrender to Him. A surrendered life is a different life. You can't continue swearing. You can't continue sinning. You can't continue just doing as you please, drinking and smoking and and just carrying on and destroying your life with all those things because God says, come follow me. There's a change. There's a surrender, meaning I lay my life down. I don't live for myself anymore. There needs to be a change. I thought Christianity is not works-based. It isn't. God accepts you just as you are. He welcomes you in just as you are. But then he says, to follow me, you need to take up your cross. Why should I suffer? Well, why should Jesus have suffered? Why should he have endured the cross? Why should he have gone through countless of pains that you cannot even imagine, that you cannot even begin to understand, and we think we're going to have it all perfect in life? It's not going to be that way. God never promised everything's going to be okay, but God promised, I'm going to be with you no matter what you go through. Even sometimes it feels that I'm not there. I am there. I am wiping your tears. I am holding you when you don't feel it. I've got you in the palm of my hands if you would just trust me, says the Lord. And that trust can only grow with intimacy with God and His Word. 
You can't grow trust. You can't just conjure it up. You need to spend time with God. So if you tell me you don't trust Him, and if you tell me He's a bad God, I'm going to tell you you haven't spent enough time with Him, because if you spend enough time at the feet of Jesus, you will realize He's the best King you can ever have. And you will trust Him. You've got to spend time with Him. The second thing is, it requires us to listen to His voice. His voice is life. He says in the, in the word, John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. They listen to my voice. Proverbs 3, verse 6 says, seek his will in all that you do and he will show you which path to take. Will he make all the paths straight? No, sometimes he will show you a path and he will say, go down that road and Man, that road will be full of thorns and it'll look dangerous and it'll look like the most horrible path you ever had to take. And God will say, go. And you'll be like, yes, are you sure? Go, yeah, get behind me, Satan. It's not Satan, sometimes it's God. But if we trust Him, the rocky road might hurt but when we come through it. It would have been worth it. When we stand before God one day, it would have been okay. Because those that we've lost along the way, if they were in Christ, they would meet us there. See, we need to listen to His voice. And that's the problem is sometimes we don't want to listen. Sometimes we don't want to hear. But we need to open our ears and we need to listen to when He speaks. Come on, how many times, sermon in, sermon out, you are sitting and you hear the tugging of the Holy Spirit, the knocking of, of God and He's saying, do this, change this, or maybe we should work on this. And you go out and you just stay the same. And then you come back and you hear the voice again and you go out and you just stay the same. And you come back and you hear the voice again and you go out and you just stay the same. You know what happens then? The voice of the Holy Spirit becomes softer and softer and softer. And you will get to a place where you have seared your conscience. And my friend, that's a very dangerous place to be. So I want to encourage you to start listening when He speaks. Get to know His voice. Because if you don't know His voice, it means you're not spending time with Him. How can I say that? I can in a, in a crowd van a duizend mense wees, as my vrou praat, sal ek weer eens sê, hoekom? Because I know her voice. How come? Because I spend time with her. Every single day. And it's the same with God. If you want to be intimate with Him, you will get to know Him. You'll be able to stand in a crowd of millions. The devil can throw what he wants your way. The, the, the noise can be so much. But you will hear him because you know his voice. You will hear in the midst of the storm, the soft, still whisper of the Holy Spirit saying, Be still, I am with you. Be still and know, I am God. Be still and know, I've got this. See, the third thing that we require to follow Him is we require to be obedient. You see, listening is just half of the equation. We need to obey what we hear. Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Jesus replied, But even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. James 1, 22 says, But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are fooling yourselves. He continues and he says, you're like a person that looks at yourself in the mirror and then when you walk away, you forget how you look. And we've got to obey. You can't come to the Word of God and read something and just go like, eh, okay, it's not for me. You don't have a cut and paste Bible. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the Bible. You can't take anything out and you can't add to it. There's a very dangerous warning to those who do. You can't do as you please. You need to follow God. You see, we, 
And, and, and that's the thing is people think we're trying to do good to please God. We're not. We're not doing good to win God's favor because we can't. We're doing good because we have God's favor already. We're doing good because God loves us already. We're sinning less because we love God and He loves us. That's how it works. It's not because I want to earn His love or I want to earn His grace because you can't. We need to live in such a way that is pleasing to Him. Why? Because He loves us and we love Him. It's the same thing when you're married. Do you still carry on doing as you please or do you actually sacrifice and suck it up sometimes? If you don't, then you don't understand marriage. Because covenant means I am yours and you are mine. Covenant means I lay my life down and I become yours. Meaning what, what interests me will have to sit on the bench because I want to please you and I want to make you happy. Meaning if, I, if I'm not really interested in it, it's fine. I'll get interested in it because I love you that much. And that's how it works with God. You see, we need to walk in obedience. We need to stop being spectators and start being followers of Jesus. We need to stop coming to church services in and out and in and out and everything just remains the same because, my friend, if everything just remains the same, you have a problem. Because if you truly experience God, if you truly read His Word, if you truly understand what He says and you apply it to your life, things will start changing in your life. You can't come into church and just go out and just carry on being the same you. Because we apply the word, and as we apply the word, we grow, and as we grow, we become more like Christ, and as we become more like Christ, the world can see more of Jesus in us. And how many times have we preached about temper, anger, forgiveness, and how many times have you gone out here, and you're still the bitter, hard person that you, that you were all the time? It's because you haven't applied what we've preached and it's not about us who preach, man. It's the fact that the word is being preached and you've got to apply the word to your life in order for it to have an effect. We can't preach if you honor your wife and wives, if you submit to your husbands, things will go better in your, in, your, in your marriage relationship. And you go out here and you just mistreat your wife still and you scream at her and, and you gaan af op haar and do net wat you will and say what you will. You're stupid, you this, you that. And wives just carry on doing what they want and you think, ah, my marriage is falling apart. It's falling apart because you're not doing what the Word of God says you should do. You're not applying the Word. You're being a fool according to James. If you want change in your life, stop spectating. Stop telling God how things should look. Stop telling God how things should work and say, God, I surrender to you and I do what you want me to do. Then you'll start seeing things change. If your children aren't going to heaven, it's your fault, fathers, because you're not praying enough. You're not setting the example. You're not doing as you, you should. You're not applying the word. And I know this is a very hard message. But I'm preaching this to you because I love you that much. That I would rather have you hate me for telling you the truth. And love. Than patting you on the back and saying everything's okay. Just carry on living, man. You can't. We can't preach against racism and the word of God is against it and you go out and you kaffer voort. You can't. A kaffer nie meer nie, ek houd kop. Same thing. Same thing. Ook in jy groen is. Same thing. Because it's with the same intent, the same heart. You can't judge people because of how they look, because of how they smell, because of what they do. You can judge Christians, mot not motives, you can judge their fruit. We're allowed to do that if we're Christian, but someone who's not, you can't judge them. You need to love them. 
And even those Christians who aren't walking the walk, you still need to love them in the judgment. But things need to change. Why? Because I surrender myself to God, which means I am dead. I no longer live. What makes me happy doesn't count anymore because it's what makes God happy. And you know what? It sounds pretty unfair, but I promise you, as soon as you start living that way, God goes, here, this is what you've been praying for, isn't it? As soon as you do it, God goes, I'm with you. I'm interested in you. I care about what makes your heart tick. I care about what makes you happy. Because that's, it's a marriage. (laughs) We are married to God. And the same way a marriage works with your wife and your husband, you live to please them. And they live to please you. So it's, it's a balance. Everybody wins. And it's the same with God. If we live to please Him, He will work in our favor. Will He always do what pleases you? No, because sometimes what pleases you is really bad for you. And He'll give you what you need. God always gives what we need. It's just not always in the packaging we want it. But that's why we need to listen so that we can hear when it's Him saying, Hear my child. And when we surrendered, we can go, man, even if it's not in the packaging, I receive it. I will take it. See, there's a purpose in the pain. There's a purpose in the trials. There's a purpose in the tribulations. Can I tell you what it is? No, I can't. Because sometimes you need to figure it out on your own. Sometimes someone else can't tell you what it is. Sometimes only God can. But you'll never hear Him explain to you what the purpose is if you don't get to listen to His voice and obey Him. We need to get to a place where we follow Jesus, where we surrender everything, every bit of who I am to Him. You know why? Because He's worth it. He didn't think twice when He gave His entire life to you. And it cost Him, it cost Him dearly. It cost Him to move from a position of being creator to being created. The creator became what he created just to show you how much he cares for you. Just to show you how much he's willing to do to get to your heart. You see, and Jesus will relentlessly pursue you until the day you choose to surrender. Or until the day you die because then it's too late. So I want to challenge you to make a difference today. I want to challenge you to hear that that tugging on your heart of Jesus' voice saying, come, follow me. And I'm not going to ask you to pray a prayer or to follow me in certain words. It's between you and God to make that choice and to say, God, I give it all to you. And it's between you and God to actually make a choice and to surrender and not just pray a couple of words. I want to leave you today with the verse I started with, but I want to read it in the Amplified, Matthew 16, 24. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, Can you hear that? Take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. Whether it means I'll lose something, I'll lose someone, whether it means I'll get hurt, whether it means I will get sick, whether it means I will go through trials and tribulations, whether it means Satan's going to come at me with all that he's got, I will choose to endure. Because you know what the Bible says about those who endure? They'll receive a crown of righteousness. See, it's not about this life, it's about what comes after. And he carries on and he says, And follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example, in living, if need be, suffering, or perhaps dying because of faith in me. 
No, but Jesus won't, that ex- won't expect that of me. Yes, he will. Because that's what it means to follow him. We are very blessed to be able to serve God openly in our country. There's nations that die every day because of their faith in Christ. And you know what? If you look them in the eye one day in heaven, they'll tell you it was worth it. They'll tell you the suffering and the beating was worth it. They'll tell you being skinned alive was worth it. They'll tell you being burned at the stake was worth it. Why? Because Jesus is worth it. Let's choose today to follow him through anything and everything, if need be in suffering and if need be in dying also. Let's follow him because he chose to give us everything of who he is. Let's give him nothing less than everything of who we are. Let's close our eyes. God, I know today was was a heavy message, Lord. But I know it's a message from your heart. And I know it's what you wanted us to hear. Because you are calling the church to to a new era, God. The era of where we will no longer sit on the bench and watch, but we will partake. We will be part of your kingdom. We will pray and the sick will recover. We will shine our lights and the darkness will flee. God, we want to be partakers. We've had enough of just spectating. We've had enough of just looking from the bench, of being bench warmers. We want to be who you called us to be. The husbands, the wives, the fathers, the mothers, the children, the followers, the disciples. We want to be who you made us to be, God. And we pray today that you will let this word sink deeply into our hearts. That the Holy Spirit will plant this seed so deep that nothing can steal it from us. And that we will walk out of this day on fire for you, God with a new heart, a new passion, a new desire to follow you. God, not just in word, but in deed. To surrender everything of what we've got and give it all to you because you deserve nothing less. I thank you for that. Thank you for speaking to us, Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will continue your work as we go our way today that you'll continue to work inside of us, continue to speak to our hearts, to meet our needs, to work in our heartache, to work in our trials and tribulations, continue to be our peace and our joy. Give us a longing desire to seek more of you every single day. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.